Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the RationalInvestor.com's Broiler Chicken Show. This is our weekly uh, offering uh, to try and sort of help our level oneers uh, work through uh, their education program. Uh, I think we're on uh, MACD and MACD divergences right now. Uh, understanding. Uh, price divergence. I suppose also too, uh, maybe last week, maybe the week before they were doing uh, OBV and OBV divs. Yeah, doing OBV. And also, I guess we have Willy oscillators coming up. So they're right in the thick of uh, learning the candy store, actually the level one portion of the candy store. I actually we have some people in the past who've uh, We've done really well just learning the basic concepts of level one program and going on to do really well in the market. So uh, great to see that they're all marching along. Unfortunately, though, if I understand correctly, um, our level one instructor lives a bit in the uh, back country. And uh, unfortunately, he has a power outage right now. So he's um, a bit MIA today. So I'm not quite sure how we're going to do this. I do see that the... Uh, the viewership here of this video is a little bit light here. Um, also, to um, you know, if we were going to define a crypto winter, <laughs> I think uh, um, we are now in the depths of the winter, and. Um, Probably, you know, kind of like when the when the cold weather comes and the snow dumps and it's like a foot of snow and everything's all icy and horrible and the wind's blowing and it's like minus forever degrees. Um, you know, if anything, you know, think of it as sort of like you're skipping along through the middle of the summer and barefoot in the grass and uh, playing with the puppies and throwing balls in the backyard and then swings and stuff. You don't think about how bad the winter's going to be. Well, ironically enough, uh, I would say right now in the depths of crypto winter, I probably don't think about how nice uh, the summer will be when it gets here. <laughs> so uh, is your glass half empty? Is your glass half full? Um, they often say that, uh, this is the only business when stuff goes on sale, nobody wants to buy. The question is, uh, I guess, really, ultimately, um, what's the stuff that's going to survive uh, into the next season? And um, I would uh, maybe even suggest that, uh, you know, actually a really good place to start. I had a few people saying, you know, where, where where's a good list for me to concentrate on? And I would say our crypto uh, top 30 list is a pretty darn good place to start. Most of these names have been around a few years. Um, they've been around actually as long as I've been in the space. So some of course have just come on the scene over the past year or two. But generally speaking, these, these guys have been around almost the whole time that I've been in the space. There's another thing. So, um, I know there's that um, uh, there's a project that uh, we're working on at TRI to try and clean up all the little errors on the site. And I know we have one gentleman on the site is sort of quarterbacking that. I uh, hope he can maybe ask the tech department to try and uh, uh, get rid of some of the duplicates that we have. And as they say, uh, we've never been closer. The site is coming along. And just that's got to be taken care of. Yeah, where are we here? I'll just sit here in this video and point out all the errors on the site. Maybe that'll motivate the team. I don't know. Uh, there's that marketing guy. Send it to him. Maybe he can help the team out.
Uh, hey, David. David says, uh, ask you all kindly to uh, give us a like and a help and a subscribe and a, all those kind of fun things. Um, let's see, there was something else that I was uh, mentioning before we got going that I wanted to pass on to the team as well. I don't know what it was. Anyway, I'm sure it will come to me. Anyway, um, unfortunately, as you can kind of see from there, our our built tools. Uh, yeah, I, I might even say proprietary, uh, but um, uh, we're not getting the most optimistic of <laughs> views here this week. If anything, what we like to do is uh, is uh, teach the students. Uh, you should have three unrelated reasons for consider taking a trade. Um, first reason, I think, always. I mean, there are different schools of thought. You know, a really good example of the first reason uh, to justify taking a trade. Uh, I remember a few years ago, um, there's a whole bunch of people that were super, uh, uh, super uh, bullish, bearish, I don't know. Uh, bearish, I guess, down at the very bottom end of the trading range. And I just don't think that that was a, uh, whoops, what am I doing here? Uh, I want to get rid of everything. I have a blank screen here for you. Um, back here, a whole bunch of people were super uber bearish down here. Uh, and it was funny. At this point, um, there is a really cool uh, video. Bitcoin, please go to moon. Tony Ve, no, how's it go? Yeah, Tony Ve say we go down to one K, but Mr. Nova Grasse, we have bought out. Bottom it out. <laughs> that was such a great video. Of course, uh, if you haven't been in crypto long enough to know that video, then uh, you need to uh, get yourself up to speed. Actually, that was a pretty recent reference. Anyway, so that was down in here. And a really, really good analogy that trade location is so critical in this game. Um, you know, years ago, I um, used to work with guys who used to love trading with fibs. And fibs are an easy way to sort of see trade location. And I just have a general rule. If you're watching this video as a uh, somebody part, as part of the public and not really knowing much about crypto. Make it really simple for you. And this, I just drew off an arbitrary number. Uh, probably the easiest thing for you to do to keep it as simple as possible is just make the bottom of your study zero. Um, you see, that didn't really move a hell of a lot. And green boxes are buying windows, not really selling windows. And actually, you know, I've been, you know, working in this space now, especially uh, uh, for. Uh, crypto, but uh, venture cap. I mean, geez, I was a VSC stockbroker for a long time. I'm really liking the idea, of maybe even calling the venture cap reload zone the 78.6. Uh, we'll call this the, the VC RLZ. Um, 78.6 to 88.6. Our education program, I used to uh, be a prop trader trading crude oil uh, and a lot of the big stocks and all that kind of stuff, indexes, commodities. And generally speaking, the reload zone is uh, 61.8, 50, 61 yeah, we'll call this maybe like the commodity RLZ. Um, Anyway, a bit like a different color down here. Something like that. And I make that a little lighter. There you go. Something like that. That's not a bad image. 
So the point being that you get down into this area, and I even remember there was a um, there was a, one particular CME trader who was coming out and saying, you know, we screen just squeezed out as just about as much of the blood from this stone as possible. Probably not a good idea to be too aggressively negative uh, down here. And sure enough, pow, huge rally. And, you know, just to give you a really good idea of the fibs going, they work both directions. What do you think the odds are that this was a reload short zone right up here where it's stalled out? Maybe you should have, once we got up to that area, maybe tempered your bullish enthusiasm. In fact, uh, I used to work with this trader guy down on the floor of the CME. Oh my goodness, look at all this fun stuff they've done now. It's too bad, actually, because they had, uh, well, it looks like they've, uh, they've organized this a little bit better. They used to have a big M in this list of symbols, and I used to always put that on the chart as my mountain man reference, but you can see they took that away. Jerks. Not quite sure why. Uh, maybe... Uh, Maybe it's in all this, just under a different heading. I was for a while putting on this W and just putting it backwards, big M. Uh, anyway, uh, it's not really a great reference piece, but I used to call that the mountain man. And I used to work with this guy, Brandon. Uh, and it was funny, somebody was even... Um, Somebody was even asking me about timing your trades, like how long are you actually in the trade? And I even uh, told them a story on this site. The, uh, on Friday, I did a, uh, I did a, um, I think, uh, I think the, 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 the site video I did was like three hours. <laughs> I just, um, I, uh, I hadn't talked to the community in a couple of days and uh, I had a few things on my mind just when we literally started at the start of the market and went through the whole damn market. Um, so anyway, I was telling them a story about how Brandon actually uh, chastised me for being in a trade too long. So yeah, some people do use uh, time uh, references. Anyway. So uh, and this is, this is actually a pretty good analogy of a trader's life. There's a lot of good learning material just in this image right here. But, um, you know, I guess that we always talk about the, the three reasons for a trade. Um, and I always think that that should go uh, three reasons for a trade. It should always be unrelated. Um, I do see a lot of, you know, like, um, uh, in fact, uh, we're kind of trying to work on it, you know, these, all these YouTube shorts and all this kind of stuff. I see a lot of people talk about their individual setups, but I don't, you know, I see that they, you know, these little videos say, go and pull up this indicator, go and pull up that indicator. And whenever this line crosses that line, you buy it. Whenever this crosses that, you sell. And uh, look at this, it, it produced a trade of 200% return. It's like, okay, I don't know whether that's really in your best interest. I really like this idea that um, try, you know, just even write this down, right? Three unrelated reasons for a trade. Number one should always be, location and i don't really hear too many people talk about location um you know just think of the three words in real estate that's the easiest way for you to remember it <laughs> three reasons for a trade location 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 <laughs> um so anyway number one always should be location i always think that you should start out with Okay, I'm gonna go and buy this thing. Is it cheap? Is it expensive? How do you figure out if something is cheap or something is expensive? Uh, a lot of people use fundamental analysis. Uh, 
I like to use, uh, you know, on the site in particular, when we're sort of chit-chatting day in, day out, we use uh, sites like uh, this FinViz. They do a great job breaking down the fundamentals of stocks. Um, so we use a number of different metrics uh, based on all this data here to try and figure out if stocks are cheap or st if stocks are expensive. Um, so you can do it fundamentally. Um, I think also too, like I said, you can do it technically. And uh, in this particular case, uh, we're using FIBS. There's a number of different, uh, you know, um, um, my uh, Kusho co-host here, uh, I used to work uh, at this prop firm, uh, geez, a decade ago now. But it's great to see the uh, one of the principals at the firm. Uh, he still is just plugging away. He used to have a, a trading post right on the floor of the CME between the Dow and the S&P pits. Um, and um, he's a really, really big fan of volume profile. You know, so volume profile is another way you could figure out trade location. Um, Point here is, you know, this for our conversation just right here, this is a pretty good example of one particular trade location tool that we teach in our basic program. And if anything, you know, this is a really good analogy of you can see how the market came slamming down into 61.8. This would be a typical commodity traders trade that they're just going to buy that. And then on this bounce, right, you might do something like use a, um, uh, I think Julian's all excited about um, SMA. I think um, he's all excited these days about, uh, I think like it's a 50 period moving average he likes. Uh, it's, it's fun to see, you know, I'm gonna hand it to Julian. I mean, he's been plugging away for, you know, eight years working with me. Uh, some people are just sort of like, they just, they have to find their own sort of rhythm, their own, beat, if you will. Um, and um, as I said, uh, a, you know, I, I specifically asked him to do a show on the site one day a week. Um, and I, you can see, you know, over the years, he is getting better and better at his craft. And um, one of the indicators that he likes using now, I don't know whether he uses it as a return to the mean or not, but, you know, some people like using a 50 period moving average. Here's a pretty good example where, you know, a guy like Mountain, he would buy that 61.8 because it's a stab down the bottom in the range, reload zone, all that. Uh, look to sell a portion of the position on a check of the mean. And you can use things like a 50 period moving average as a return to the mean. And that's what this bounce is here. Say, so boing, straight up into there. Let, you know, maybe buy two contracts, um, you know, two units, whatever it is this you're trading, two Bitcoins, if you can afford it. Let one of them go on a return to the mean. Right? So there's a nice profit there. Yeah, right on. Put your stop to scratch or just, you know, where you bought the asset um, on the second one. And if the market just keeps going, well, you just get stinking rich. In this case, eh, market wasn't done. It stopped out on the second contract. You still made a chunk of money on that first contract. So the second one, eh, you walk away at scratch and it's a small profit. That's a very typical trader's life. And a guy like Mountain, uh, he would be doing this exact same thing off of something like a 30 minute chart. Um, uh, probably oh, where a good example of that might be. Uh, let's see. Well, I guess any of these really. Something like, uh, there. So bounce back to there. Mind you, the moving average is below that. No, it doesn't work. Uh, where's one that'll work for you? Just trying to give you an example so you know what I'm talking about. This is now, this would be like a day trader's life. Right. Uh, let's flip this around. Uh, boing, boing. So here, tag 61.8, I'll sell two. I will buy one back um, at uh, the mean. 
stop to scratch in this particular case stopped out at scratch might have even hit it again at this cell one uh, at the mean and this one actually went a bit further uh, how you could man, i suppose you could probably do even one there oops i don't know why it's going on there there cell buy it back at the mean stop at scratch man, i got blown out Maybe you sold this tag at 61.8, sell one at the mean, stop at scratch, and then woohoo, profit central. So anyway, it's a little bit different conversation. Anyway, so the point that I just make is, uh, I think you should always start the conversation is, is this a good trade location? So happens to be one tool. Me personally, I mean, the irony of it all, is that I personally like, uh, I don't want to uh, upset the apple cart, but we'll put a B there for Brian. I personally, my favorite fib is the 78.6. I love that. And I often find, if you are, I mean, geez, you know, like you do those shorts and, wow, look at this killer trade. Uh, oh, you could have made 10 bazillion percent. Um. I often, and I often tell you guys, I hope you guys are learning this. Markets will often come back to that 78.6 and then bottom right off it and then take off. And you look back in hindsight, say over here, and you look back and you go, God damn, look at that. Right off that stupid 78.6. So I often uh, love hunting off of that 78.6 level. That's become sort of my favorite fib. And, um, you know, as a, there's one gentleman that I respect in this uh, crypto space immensely, uh, Simon Dixon. And yeah, he just sort of is like, you know, I'm not really a big TA guy. I just want to take over the world. <laughs> I love his attitude. Uh, but uh, he just says that, and I thought maybe I just had it on here, but it didn't look like a damn thing. Well, we'll just throw it on here. And he just said, look at any time. And hey, seriously, folks, I mean, are you here to learn how to make money from trading or what? Hey, anyway, um, he usually just says, and actually can't really see it here very well, but he usually just says, anytime you see Bitcoin correct 80%, of a previous move, and you gotta get in there and start buying. Think location, right? Location, location, location. Um, so uh, you can do all the fancy schmancy fibs. You know, that's all these numbers, 61.878.68.6, right? And then on the dare downside, look at this. I mean, this was a killer trade. And I remember when the market went like this, we had one guy who was a relatively new guy to trading. And man, he just was an emotional basket case through this. He just, you know, the price was screaming up. He went through all this. He's worried about the market collapsing and he just froze. And yet that is such a cliche level. I mean, it's like you, you literally, I mean, this is an absolute perfect scenario of, you know, he'll, Brandon would just simply sell two. We'll buy one back at the mean, right? Tag the 50 period moving average. If you only use a 50 period moving average and a whole bunch of different ways to figure out the mean. Uh, and then stop to scratch on the remaining and woohoo, look how far that one went down. And actually it's interesting, somebody over there on YouTube made reference. Uh, one of the best trades I think I've seen in the entire eight years that I've been in crypto and one of the nicest guys in the world, of course, good old Brian completely fucked up the relationship. No idea how, but I'm such a doofus. Um, and um, immense respect for the guy. I sure hope he's doing well in this world. Um, but um, he had the balls and he, he basically learned this. That's the whole point of why I did this program. So I guess it's a success in some regard. 
Um, but he basically uh, just stepped in and bought that 88.6 stab right there against that original double double bottom there, right? What a killer level. So that was our Kavarkinator guy. Um, I think he, I think he, I did my job teaching him how to trade. <laughs> so way to go, Kevin, wherever you are in this world. Um, well, I mean, like I said, there's the 78.6. I would have been happy to buy there. He was a total sharpshooter. Also too, you know, this is a really good lesson for everybody that this dump here had absolutely nothing to do with Bitcoin. So um, whenever you see a market dump like this, and this story is completely unrelated to this actual asset, then when it dumps down into these key fibs and against original market structure, that, that's, that's a wicked tell. And sure enough, I mean, geez, if, you had, if you'd only done one trade, no Sam Bankman, Friedman, whatever the fuck that guy's name is. No Do Quans, no Vitalics, no DeFi's, no nothing. I'm a Bitcoin maximalist. I did one trade over the past five years. I stepped in and bought that 88.6 test of the original market structure bottom. You'd be a genius, right? Everybody would think you walk on water. It's just one trade. It's so simple. Um, anyway. So have I driven home the importance of trade location to you guys? <laughs> I hope so. Uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's tragic and I'm sure, you know, it's just one trade and I sort of harp on it just because it stood out so much, you know, Tony, they say we go down to one case. But when you're in green boxes, getting all uber bearish, that's not usually a good idea. Conversely, when you're in red boxes, is it a good idea to get uber bullish? Eh, generally not. And it's just, it's the first reason if I get up into red boxes, I have to start thinking either I should be you know, paying myself if I did buy down below because we've had a pretty nice move up. And then if I'm feeling really aggressive, well, maybe I should be thinking about actually selling, maybe even shorting or buying. Me personally, I don't really like open-ended shorts. I'd much rather just buy a put option, but that's just the way I am. Put options are dangerous though unto themselves, folks. I know a lot, I see a lot of people on YouTube and a lot of people in social media and stuff starting to warm to options trading as a way to juice returns. And that's usually a potion for disaster. And what I'm actually seeing now coming out of this space, and this usually happens at the bottom of markets, is now what I'm hearing is, well, all these social media influencers and stuff, they have a fiduciary responsibility and they're giving investment advice. And if it's not right, sue, sue, sue. Remember, that's how I, that's, a, I mean, I came from the stockbroker world. That's why I, I, a lot of times I won't tell you what to buy or sell because <laughs> I've seen, you know, one. And the worst part about it is the guy who sues is usually the guy that you know right out of the gate. This guy's got trouble written all over him. He's just coming here. Just tell me what to buy and what to sell, and, and the rest doesn't matter. And uh, I'm a busy guy. I don't have time to pay for trade. That's a waste of my time. Those kind of guys. Oh my God. That's got just, if you want to run, you know, and this is from a guy, you know, running one of these silly advisory services, which I don't know. I don't even know if we even do that or not. But when you hear that, your the hairs on the back of your head should go up hey this guy's got uh he's gonna destroy my business written all over him and those guys they will call up their lawyers and they will sue in a heartbeat they will revenge sue right in fact it got so bad they uh, they actually have a name for the lawsuits right they call them like nuisance lawsuits anyway blah 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 um, so trade location, pretty darn important. Maybe that's the theme of today's show. I don't know, but let's fast forward to today. So there's your price charge. Just eyeballing that. Should we be overly bearish down here? 
Should we be hunting shorts? I don't know. I think, that, I think the story's getting a little bit stale. Uh, we do the uh, same logic. Where's the top of the market? And we'll take this down. We'll even use a zero as our uh, starting point. Mr. Gann would suggest you do that as a good way to sort of figure out where markets should correct to over time. Uh, as he would just simply say, just take that high, divide it by two. So there is uh, Mr. Gann sort of, this is a, you know, in Mr. Gann's world, this would be the mean. <laughs> Something along those lines. Well, all I did was just take the all-time high and just do a fib off of zero line. There's our reload zone. What did we say about green boxes? So we are officially in a green box. Um, wonder what 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 do we call? Oops. What do we call this? Uh, Maybe puke green. Is that, is that a good uh, reference? Because the market is puking out. Once we get down, remember Simon Dixon's rule? If the market corrects 80%, just buy the goddamn thing. And, you know, honestly, uh, a lot of tech technical analysis is just to, just to keep it as simple as possible. Just trying to keep things just simple <laughs> don't overthink this stuff i see a lot of people in this business they end up just overthinking things and over analyzing in fact actually uh you know i made reference to mr hoagland he would always say you know i think you're getting paralysis from over analysis so anyway um so here's uh mr gans uh keep you honest indicator and i always try to Get people to, uh, you know, don't, you know, uh, we have one gentleman on the site and I'm so proud of him. He's such a good person. Now he's a father of twins. Uh, way to go, Colin. I think Colin won that the game of life. And the good part about it is he's a really nice person. I could take lessons on how to uh, be more like Colin. Um, but uh, he's a big fan whoops, of... Uh, I used to work with a guy, actually, the exact opposite. This guy, uh, Ray Burchette out of New York, crusty as all hell. <laughs> this is so crusty. But uh, he really liked uh, 38.2. And the rule working with Ray was that uh, at any given point in time, you have to expect the market's going to correct 38.2s. Then, like we said, we have Mr. Gann sitting there saying, well, you know, if I had my druthers, the mean is 50%. So if this is still a bull market and we're doing nothing more than just making uh, higher highs and higher lows, right? That's what defines a bull market. Um, you'll often find that this pullback here is, uh, we can, uh, let's see if I'm even close. This pullback here will be that and we like to call it Collins pump chaser zone, right? Right in there. And just consistently, if it is a bull, uh, you know, either uh, Mr. Burchette or, uh, or Mr. Gann is satisfied and we get that 38.2 pullback. Pretty normal. And I do like how Colin sort of labeled it his own, right? And I like that. Uh, if you are going to be a student of mine, I will strongly suggest always that you sort of put personal ownership on these concepts and sort of give them your own flavor. But, you know, there's a good example, a nice simple trending market, 38.2 pullback, 38.2 pullback, 38.2 pullback, et cetera, et cetera. And just, this is what they call climbing the wall of worry. Because everybody thinks each one of these dumps, oh, we're just going right back down to the bottom. And it, ironically enough, you'll know that the bull market is over when everybody uh, up here starts going, uh, oh no, this time it's different. We're never going back down. And you really should buy up markets. Dad, don't worry about technical analysis. Don't listen to that Beamish guy. He doesn't know what the hell he's talking about. And that invariably is exactly when the whole damn thing starts to fall apart. So anyway, 
So, you know, the, I, we teach in the education program these various FIB levels, um, and I think they're helpful. You know, what is really interesting is uh, uh, Mike Novogratz, uh, he was going on for the longest time that uh, he figured that, you know, 30, 40,000 was probably fair value for Bitcoin. And interestingly enough, right, if we actually do this FIB off of this high, the high, and this was that Doge uh, dog money high, which is a bit of an embarrassment for this space. And I wonder whether that guy did that on purpose, it kind of hijacked the, the last cycle. And that sailor guy, oh goodness, what a mess. And I, and I don't get it. Like Brian sits here and blabs away for hours on end, trying to give you guys helpful tools that you can use. But people just blindly listen to those uh, those those guys. They don't even really teach you anything while they're blabbing away. They just bark, oh, I think this, I think that. And people just blindly buy. And they buy into tunes of like tens of millions, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars. Anyway, um, so here's a good example. Uh, on this particular dump, this was the dog money dump. In fact, I think probably we'll call this peak the... If any of you guys have been following me, the Sedona Euphoria peak. <laughs> uh, uh, dog money peak, <laughs> we'll call it that. And I, I, I gotta be proud of myself. I took 50 Gs out of uh, dog money on that rally peak. So what the hell, 50 grand's 50 grand. Anyway, uh, Mr. Novogratz, uh, in, in, in a good typical fashion, Right, basically, and this is why you know Raber Shed, Colin Novogratz, you know, these are pretty good, you know, knowledgeable traders. Um, and they're looking for that 38.2 pullback, which is normal, like we said, it's, it's what bull markets do. Um, your clue that there should have been problems here was, uh, if you now go to step number two of our uh, process. So what do you think step number two is here? <laughs> There's David, just tell me what to buy and what to sell and the rest doesn't matter. Uh, what do you think number two is? Anybody help me here? We got 38 people. Frivolous lawsuits, tell me about it. Adam, you're in fucking the capital of frivolous lawsuits. It's horrible, like living down in California. Oh, goodness. I mean, try going into the medical profession in California. I mean, yeah, literally the medical malpractice insurance is what actually bankrupts you. The reason why doctors cost so much money uh, down in the States is because of the medical malpractice insurance. It's ridiculous. Uh, okay, close. Uh, Matador got it. Uh it's really what I, you know, and if you do take the education program, of course, we really try to drive this home. There, there's actually a number of different um, ways that you can measure momentum. So momentum is an okay concept to use, but what are we talking about specifically? So uh, specifically, and this is where... You know, you see all the guys on these uh, YouTube shorts and all this kind of stuff. And I've developed a million dollar trading system. A lot of times what they do is they have an indicator that they really like, you know, like Julian's absolutely in love with his RSI. But what he doesn't understand and, you know, I, and I think he has, he's learned over the past eight years that this is just, it's just one tool. But basically, indicator confirmation. I think this should be your second reason for justifying acting. And you know, the interesting thing with this is we can we can study um, indicators built on volume and like money flow. Is money flowing into the asset? Is it flowing out? Is the pace of money flowing into the asset growing or is it weakening? Those that's indicator information. Uh, we can study price and the actual movement of the the assets price itself in the marketplace. 
And interestingly enough, and I don't actually include this in the level one program, but we do to a de facto, I just don't have a formal module on it, but you can also do volatility. Uh, and so that's things like, um, you know, there's statistical measures of volatility. That's things like Keltner bands, uh, Keltner channels. And really, that's not the best way. That's the name of an indicator. But um, think of, um, what is it? It's a standard deviation, right? Standard. Uh, no, it isn't. It's ATR, beg your pardon. Uh, ATR, which is like uh, your, um, uh, how do we say this? The size of the range, eh, it's kind of a bit big. Probably could work on the wording a bit better there. And then things like, um, well, so, and you can measure size of the range through things like uh, ATR. So that's like your average true range or things like, you know, Bollinger Band, which is stand, standard deviation. So, there are a number of different ways that you can go about the indicator confirmation road. Um, in our level one program, uh, we primarily concentrate on uh, volume and money flow analysis and price analysis in our indicators. Uh, and I think if I was going to do a revision of the level one program going forward, I'd probably add in vol volatility studies as well. Um, and what we're really looking for here is this idea, I mean, ideally, we want to get hints from the marketplace. That's where I think a lot of people fail in this business is, is what, uh, and I, right now, all I'm going to do is I'm just going to outline the level one. I mean, in the level two program for trade location, we can talk about gaps, how often do gaps get filled in? Uh, I think you know the answer. <laughs> if you guys have been watching these free videos, we ask that question almost every single week. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we could do volume profile as well. Uh, we could do things like GAD, uh, GAN squares and all that. Moving averages, of course, that's another great trade location too. I mean, the, the, the list goes on and on and on and on. But just for the level one program, keep in mind, we're supposed to be doing just our level one here, right? Um, primarily, we just talk about FIBS and level one. I don't, keep in mind, the level one program, I mean, we're throwing just a world of information at you. We're trying to teach you how to actually run a small business of trading while at the same time trying to teach you uh, basic technical analysis. I mean, talk about biting off a hell of a lot. I mean, really, the level one program, we should probably leave uh, all TA uh, uh, out of level one, just get you actually running a, a business and a business plan and all that. But nonetheless, that's here another. Um, <laughs> you know, in fact, we'll just say ETC. Um, so, as I said there a moment ago, I don't see many people, and I think this is a major shortcoming. I'm not quite sure why it's this way. But I don't actually see many people on the sort of social media bent and all that kind of stuff talk about the multiple components that go into actually a half decent trade idea. I.e., you first want to ask whether you're buying a rich asset or a, a uh, um, no, that's not right, an overvalued asset versus an undervalued asset, those kind of things. Um, I mean, you can use indicators to help you see like uh, oscillation. Um, you know, RSI oversold, RSI overbought, Willy indicator, if you know what that is. But uh, I think, you know, understanding, um, you know, statistical measures, things like FIB studies, and just putting sort of the price into context of where we are, given uh, the statistical studies, I think that's very, very valuable. Um, anyway, so the point here is at number two, we want to refer to our indicators. And you know, for the purpose of this, we'll just keep it simple and we'll just do relative strength index. So here, uh, uh, how this is. Uh, I don't really need a moving average on here. Oh my goodness, look at all this. 
I just wanted a relative strength index out of the box, apparently. Um, hopefully what you see here, it might be a little hard for you to see. In fact, maybe I change this to like a weekly chart. All right, so hopefully what, and actually this really stands out. Um, hopefully what you see here is something odd happened. Yeah, uh, we did go to new highs here, right? And uh, as uh, that beamish guy says, in a trending market, new highs, right? At any given point in time, we should see that that 38.2 to 50% pullback, Collins uh, pump chaser zone. But something odd happened here, right? Where we went to new highs after a 38.2 i mean it's pretty normal price action but we went to new highs but then you look down at your indicator and you go whoa something's not right here this is where a lot of people fall into the trap is you know maybe they did have the balls to buy down here when your rsi is nice and we or even the dip against these lows and oh my god look how smart i am i'm buying down the bottom end of range blah 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 now the market's going up and you just want the party to continue, party to continue. But you look down at your indicator and the indicator is actually going completely the other direction. Uh-oh, that's a bad sign. And I got to tell you, if it's one thing that this whole space got completely wrong, and I don't know why more people didn't mention this, was this divergence and momentum should have been a massive warning sign to the whole damn community. There is something majorly wrong here. So would like, and this is the concept of divergence. I don't see a lot, you know, if we were going to do YouTube shorts, you know, what is divergence? Can you learn to identify divergence? Divergence will keep you out of a lot of trouble. Well, a lot of people just don't respect this uh, divergence message. Might have been maybe the fact that, well, last cycle, there wasn't a hell of a lot of divergence, although what high is that? That was 89.95, and what do we get to here? 90.22, look at that. So no major divergence here. So I bet a lot of people looked at this uh, bull here and went, well, there was no divergence here and the market just kept going up, so screw you. Uh, but I think that that was a major, major warning. And then finally, uh, so, you know, as we stand right now, we can say, you know, we have drawn this over here now. We can say, you know, we're not in the red boxes now. So uh, that's a little, and actually you want to do a really cool red box is you could even do fog and bombs to try and see what sort of upside uh, red boxes might be. Um, and anytime you see a big honking W in price structure, you can actually draw a study of this range here. Does it, in essence, think of this, uh, whole W pattern, especially that level there to that level there. This is like a war zone where the bears are in control. Then the bulls are like, no, 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 we're in control. Then the bears are like, no, 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 we're in control. And then the bulls go, no, 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 we're in control. And then, you know, if you actually do break out to new highs, well, then that's a vote that the bulls have won that battle. The bulls have won that battle. The bulls have won that battle. The bulls have won the battle. So think of this as like a whole bunch of energy that's all being built up in here. And uh, you know, one concept to try and teach you this in the level two course is we do a module on point and figure charting. And interestingly enough, I think the point and figure charting actually really helps in understanding something like uh, this principle of Okay, there's a huge war here, and in any kind of war battlefield, if you've ever seen the way battles are fought, usually uh, the two armies come sort of head to head, battle, 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 one side wavers, and then they, you know, if their lines break, 
they go into full retreat. And then the winning side, they try to overrun the losing side and they push their advantage as hard as they can. So think of the movement on the other side of this W as this is the bulls have overrun the bears uh, sort of defensive lines. And, you know, they've, they've basically murdered. Think, should we use uh, modern day political references or is that just asking for trouble? I won't, I won't name names. You can uh, use your imagination who, whose lines these are. <laughs> um, so one army overruns another army. And this, the, the, ironically enough, there's actually a very specific um, sort of expression of all this energy and it turns out that uh, there was a gentleman, and this is where it gets into what's called chaos theory. Uh, but there's a gentleman, uh, Mr. Foggenbaum, who I actually found out that there's actually a mathematical uh, constant uh, with this. And you should uh, initially actually look for a 2.618 extension of this range if the bulls overwhelm the bears here and overrun their lines. And interestingly enough, that number actually, uh, the real big one, this is an initial move. And usually what ends up happening, this is what I've found. I've been seeing it too much. All right, well, I am now officially streaming. <laughs> and somebody just put momentum. <laughs> Do we still have momentum? I don't know whether we have momentum or not. Uh, I'm streaming over here, but I guess that means that we lost all the cameras and all that crap, eh? Yes, yes. That's fine. We can just blame Josh. So. See here? I think he is. Uh... All right. Well, not quite sure where I left off. But anyway, I hope you guys are getting some value out of all this. Anyway, where was I? Um, three reasons for a trade. We were talking a little bit about fog and bombs. Actually, I suppose this is probably another uh, sort of update to the course I could probably do. She's got a lot of work to update that course. And Julian is a constantly on to me. When are you going to update the course, Brian? Uh, anyway, so... Uh, we had all this over here and over there and over there. So what did you guys last hear me talk about on YouTube? Uh, I was going to do extensions. I like doing extension levels uh, for uh, price objectives as well. So actually I do like how um, 2.618. <laughs> Uh, well, I used to call this the uh, parking garage. And in a weird sort of way, you can kind of see how that worked there. And interesting how 1.618 and 2.618 also lined up. So I would consider that a red box. If you're, you know, if we're long down here and the market's pushing higher, you certainly hope that this is like a double, if not a triple and all that kind of talk. And you're selling halves on doubles and just getting a nice free, uh, risk-free trade, those kind of things. So, but if you're thinking then, and actually we did this uh, in one particular uh, altcoin last cycle, uh, good old Amanda's Penthouse and Dash, uh, we would do uh, the parking garage levels. And each of these levels, right, this would be... Uh, like women's wear... This would be household appliances. This would be, I don't know, uh, toys, toy department, that <laughs> kind of thing. So think of the, uh, the department store, uh, and these are the various levels of the department store. And you can kind of see, you know, this is one price range. That's basically like zero to 20 Gs. That's to 40 G, so that's 20 to 40, 40 to 60. So markets actually do like to move in this stair-steppy fashion. And you can see uh, anywhere above 60, we start to run out of steam. 
And probably, you know, like when we're up at that sort of 300 uh, percent third floor of the parking, uh, you know, the department store kind of idea. You want to look over at your indicators and you see, oh, my goodness, RSI is at 93. That's ridiculous. I mean, RSI does not like to get overbought. And when it is overbought, that's a major warning that, hey, thing, there's, there's a problem here. So, All right, so uh, we talked a little bit about trade location, how important trade location is. And I think right now, ironically enough, trade location is telling you probably a short is not the, the best way to go. I mean, maybe you squeeze out a couple more grand to the downside, but, you know, we just did our little mean uh, study. And, of course, uh, you know, as we had said, the whole way up, well, this principle works on the way down, too. So at any given point in time here, we should expect 38.2. So we could do, like, Collins Pump Chaser Zone going the other direction. And, you know, there is 38.2. That's $35,000, $36,000. 50% of this move is like 40, 42,000. So it's getting like uber bearish down here uh, is actually kind of asking for trouble. And then, um, you know, if we do uh, just good old fibs, ironically enough, where, where should we be thinking about selling or shorting? Well, think of this analogy, what we said last time. Where And, you know, the easiest way for you to think about this is I like the idea. Um, I used to teach uh, sports all over the lower mainland here in Vancouver. And, and I actually used to teach kids. Hell, I used to teach uh, two-year-olds how to play tennis. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of silly. But nonetheless, uh, it's definitely an experience. Um, but the way that you engage students... You engage anybody who wants to learn something is try and fill the image or the concept with colorful, descriptive uh, names and and uh, also lots of motion and lots of you know uh, imagery. That's the easiest way to convince the human brain to remember something. If I, you know, if you've never heard any of this stuff before and I say, well, just remember 61.8 and you'll do fine. I mean, I guarantee you I'll come back six uh, hours later. Now, what was that number I told you to remember? You're never going to remember it. You just won't. However, if I uh, tell you, well, you know, I used to work with this guy and man, he was a killer trader, made lots of money. But he had a beard down to here, and he used to like live up in the mountains of Colorado, and everybody called him Mountain Man, and and uh, that's the reference that I use. And you have in your brain this guy climbing up mountains and a huge gnarly looking beard and the whole damn thing. Well, you're probably gonna remember that. And actually, it's interesting. There's one guy who does um, a crypto show with me uh, through the week. Paul, he loves Mountain Man level. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we'll call Paul, Mountain Paul, Romanian Mountain Man. <laughs> yeah, well, so the Matador says he loves all the metaphors and ten, ten grain. I don't know what that means. Gore in grain. What are you saying? I got it in grain. All right. <laughs> uh, it's to try and help you remember this stuff. The more colorful, the more outlandish, the more silly the concept, the better. It, it, it works. It really does. Anyway, so the point of the matter is there's Mountain Man, you know, and interestingly enough, I mean, I don't know whether we'd want to use these uh, these chaos levels going forward. I suppose we could, but uh, interesting how they will overlap. Uh, but there's, there's Mountain Man up there. There's red boxes. So ironically enough, if I actually really wanted a short, I think I would want to be concentrating up here. And interestingly enough, I actually like the idea that this coming cycle, especially with uh, the way that that, uh, that silly little um, uh, well, I don't, I don't even know how to describe it. That absolute train wreck of those kids who, uh, you know, they're 20-year-olds. 
Um, they really don't know what the hell they're doing, just flying by the seat of their pants. And they made all the same mistakes that every greedy capitalist makes. What I do find interesting is that uh, if I said the name Bernie Madoff, would that name ring a bell? What difference is there between Bernie Madoff and Sam Bankman Freed? Actually, I don't think there is a hell of a lot of difference. I think they're almost identical, really. Now, if I said the name Bernie Evers, does that ring a bell? Eddie, you ever heard of a guy named Bernie Evers? Chris, have you ever heard of Bernie Evers? I have not. No? Doesn't ring a bell? How about uh, Kozlowski? Ooh, there's a name. Kozlowski. I think his name was Stan Kozlowski. Does that ring a bell? Bernie Ebers. Stan, I think his name was Stan Kozlowski. I don't know. Maybe, maybe I have that name wrong. Uh, what was his company? Tyco. Dennis Kozlowski. Beg your pardon, Dennis. And his name's actually Leo, not Stan. Anyway, uh, and interestingly enough, this is almost exactly the same. Um, exactly the same as uh, Danny and Magic Internet Money. This guy in the 2000.com uh, peak, um, he was out having Roman toga parties in, in Greek islands and islands in the Mediterranean and spending just absolutely outlandish amounts of money um, on, uh, on, on living the high life. And of course, charging it all back to Tycho. <laughs> uh, so, you know, there's a really important lesson for all of you to learn from this. What you see with this Sam Bankman Freed guy is nothing new at all. So that the dot-com generation, and now basically I'm going to have to rewrite the manual because I think you could make the argument that Dennis Kozlowski uh, and Tyco International, as I said, uh, Bernie Ebers, and uh, his company, let's see, uh, let's see if there's any students of the market that are actually watching this video. How many people are watching this right now? How many people are in the call here? I think it's just you, me, Joshua, Eddie, and Nick, right? Is there anybody else here? I don't think there's anybody else here. Yeah, that's it. Jesus, it's incredible how uh, everything just goes. Ah, Nick, good for you. Let's see, anybody over there? Hey, Cheryl, hi, nice to see you. Um, yeah, there's 40 people over on YouTube. Does anybody know what company uh, Bernie Ebers came from? And ironically enough, he became like this incredibly powerful company. No? Doesn't ring a bell? Worldcom. So, interestingly enough, oh, they don't even have a, they, oh, they don't even have a picture of him anymore. That's too bad. Oh, he's dead. Look at that. He died in 2020. Jesus, he just died a couple of years ago and nobody made any reference to him? Look how young he died. Jesus. Well, what is that? 59? How old is that? No. 59? 79. Well, I guess. Isn't that interesting? He's dead. Huh. Anyway exact same thing as um as sam bankman freed identical this story is absolutely identical people no difference whatsoever i would say though that the sam bankman freed guy 
he is probably more like the uh, Bernie uh, Madoff. I think that's what his name was. And what's so scary about this guy was that he was basically at the very forefront of uh, in all of American capitalism. I mean, he was the shit. He was the man. Um, and it turns out the whole damn thing was, was all just a fraud. Which is shocking, eh? Absolutely shocking. But the but you guys all have to know, and you all have to learn this, and I don't think anybody's getting this message through, that the the uh, Danny Magic Internet Money, Do Kwan Lunatics, uh, Sam Bankman Friedman wearing track pants, and a t-shirt to uh, formal interviews and it, his girlfriend i don't know whether that's that's even anyway uh she even like uh, that coffee zilla guy he's like oh my goodness that guy is just absolutely relentless i would not want to have that coffee zilla guy after me <laughs> i hope to god i never say anything to piss that guy off because oh my god he's just relentless anyway uh from what i understand i think he said it kind of cornered that uh sbf guy into actually admitting <laughs> to fraud but anyway, I mean, the point here is that actually there's nothing new going on here, folks. And every, basically every 20 years, the human species gets sucked into these vortexes. Um, and everybody just loses all sense of reason, sense of responsibility, uh, unfortunately, this go round, um, the powers that be, I think, had a helping hand with this. And you know, you've heard that uh, the Klaus guy go right. Uh, you know, oh, don't let a good crisis go to waste. And unfortunately, you know, we had uh, like six different celestial events, something that hasn't happened in like a million years, uh, all happening all simultaneously. Uh, to us silly humans. One of those, of course, is the uh, Jupiter-Saturn cross. Uh, that happens basically about once every 20 years. And I get the impression that it's actually a real function of the money system. The, the whole interest rate cycle is based on this. Uh, 40 years of rising interest rates, 40 years of falling interest rates. And unfortunately, folks, we just transitioned from a 40-year period of friendly interest rates and friendly money, and now, unfortunately, we have to go through 40 years of unfriendly money and unfriendly interest rates. Interestingly enough, one of the byproducts of a friendly interest rate environment is like things like something like a Bitcoin that technically doesn't really do anything. <laughs> so it's it's interesting listening to the talking heads you know they're sort of the ivory tower talking heads kind of say uh, exactly why what am i supposed to do with one of these bitcoin things it, maybe it will be mass adopted down the road but i actually think that this is more a function of uh this was a perfect scenario where money itself didn't cost anything and most of the public completely lost interest and lost faith and lost confidence in the money system so and all of you generation you all grew up uh you know post the dot-com world in fact uh, chris how old were you uh when uh mr madoff was uh was running his scam back there in 2000 10 years old all right so you know as a good analogy i think chris is a perfect uh, sort of uh citizen of this new generation this new millennium, you guys don't even remember this stuff. It's only old farts like me that remember this stuff. So I don't think that actually a whole hell of a lot has changed here. I think actually this is just business as usual. What's scary about this is that uh, we know that the cost of production is, um, I mean, I've shown you guys these charts repeatedly. 
cost of production is is you know I won't go into that because uh, we don't want to waste a lot of time here. It's down in this area down in here. So if anything, the commodity is starting to get back to the price where uh, at least you know if you do actually invest in it because you believe in the story and that you think there's utility in it. Uh, at least you're not chasing a fluffy price. What I'm worried about, and it'll be interesting to see how this next uh, few years plays out. What I'm worried about, though, is if you think about uh, in simplest terms, we're not in that fear cycle anymore. We're now in the grow cycle, which means that, um, you know, equity investing actually is reasonable. And we should expect the economy to grow. The only problem is we have rising interest rates now versus a falling interest rate environment, which is kind of like makes uh, investing in, in risk assets really easy. But now in this kind of environment, in a weird sort of way, um, it'll be interesting to see how the cost of production for Bitcoin changes over time. All right? If we have uh, energy costs go through the roof, if we have uh, you know interest rates themselves, the cost of money itself go through the roof. Well, how does that affect uh, Bitcoin and the blockchain story? I'm not quite sure. I mean, only time will to hell, as they say. <coughs> um. So anyway, uh, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it down the road. The way that I would look at this, and I've kind of shown you lots and lots of these charts on social media, is. Uh, and actually, you know, the best way to see it, and I love this, is, uh, you know, you guys are all very mathematical. So if we just pop on over and we check out Ben's uh, mathematical uh, view of Bitcoin, uh, then we get uh, this image. So now, like, this is the $64,000 question. This environment here is a different environment than here. This was all through the fear cycle. You know, the interest rates were falling. Baby boomers were all retiring, leaving the workforce. Uh, the Fed had to somehow keep the, the mar market going, keep sort of juicing the market. Here's more free money. Here's more free money. Dilute the shit out of the purchasing power of the currency at the same time. Thanks. Fedsters, way to go. I don't know whether we're going to be in this similar type environment. Um, it, it will be an interesting um, couple years down the road. Unfortunately, right now, though, we do have to get through a very tough part of this cycle. <clears throat> probably an easy way for you to, uh, if you haven't seen this before, but most of you probably have. Um, if we head on over to the blog, um, this gentleman lived a couple hundred years ago, who actually said that these cycles are fairly predictable. And uh, the original Benner cycle chart goes all the way back to like the 1800s. And this has been very, very consistent in predicting price action. So you can see how they were right here, right? We had that peak in 2019. The stock market actually peaked like the first two weeks of January 2020. My hunch is, uh, you know, we are going through this shit right now and it's not very, it's not much fun. <laughs> it's not very, it's not no fun at all. Um, and interestingly enough, right, if we think uh, like, 20 years down the road uh, from that peak, yeah, you can see the next major peak where Sam Bankman Freeds will do their thing, Bernie Madoffs will do their thing, um, you know, magic internet money, all that kind of talk. Well, we're really talking about sort of the mid 2030s. This decade's going to be a pain in the fucking ass. I mean, there's just no two ways to describe it. I'm sorry. Just, it is what it is. Uh, you know, we know that there is a big happening event coming up for Bitcoin, uh, 2024. 
So I think if anything, there will be a nice little rally window in crypto. You should be able to make some money, but it's not going to be the Sam Bankman Freed insane, you know, uh, basically the guy goes from nothing to, you know, $50 billion or whatever the fuck it was, the final numbers where they were. And they all thought they were like, you know, they could walk on water and stuff. I don't, well, we won't be in that kind of environment again for quite a while. Uh, we should be in sort of the soup. The question is, do we actually break out to new highs here this go round? I don't know. It's, it's, uh, the one good part about Bitcoin, of course, it does have these halvening events. So as a result, it's a sort of built in rise only market. Uh, I'm curious as to uh, how the quantum computing will start to affect this story down the road. When does that start kicking in? Because if I understand correctly, quantum computing could make this whole concept of Bitcoin kind of irrelevant. Anyway, we'll see how that goes down the road. I would say, though, that, um, you know, this is a volatile asset, and this is why I always like to sort of Try and play from a position of strength. We don't necessarily want to get into the business of predicting the future. But what we do want to do is we want to identify when assets are relatively cheap. And we do want to identify statistical sort of norms, right? This whole idea of the Collins pump chaser zone. The whole idea of Mountain Man and him hitting extremes and just simply taking profits at a return to the mean. Now, do you use something like FIBS and Collins Pump Chaser Zone as a return to the mean concept? Sure, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, do you use WD GAN and 50% rules? Well, you could even just do something really simple like uh, I'm going to use the 200 period moving average as my return to the mean. In this particular case, I mean, it doesn't look like it's painting hugely high numbers, but here we are at like, you know, 15, 16, 17,000, and this is sitting at 24, 25,000. And this happens to be the 200 week moving average. Um, I would even suggest, well, what the hell? I would even suggest that uh, the easier way to do that is uh, do a daily chart. So 200 period moving average on the dailies. Is that right? Hmm, quite interesting. Yeah, yeah, it is. I thought it was a bit higher than that, but nonetheless. Hmm. Huh. Yeah. Gaps, I wonder what that means. Mm -hmm. Hmm. All right, well, anyway, uh, point of the matter here, that's sitting at about 20,000. Usually we like to use this as a return to the mean, but Jesus. Ironically enough, if we actually get a dip down into 10,000 area and that's still sitting at 20 and change, well, there's your double. So, uh, I guess the point that I would make here is I like the fact that we're getting down into that sort of 80% area, good old Simon Dixon, uh, cheap. In fact, actually, I think I even put a tweet out to this effect. Uh, I like the idea that we're getting cheap here, but that's about it. You know, uh, I don't think we're trending higher yet. Well, this asset's cheap. And as you can see by 23 here, this might take the whole damn year to turn back up and we actually start rallying into that sort of happening event window. And I think that, you know, you just got to be patient in here. It's going to be a tough slog. There's no doubt about it. Um, so back to our sort of original conversation of all this. Three reasons for a trade. I think you can make the reason, uh, you know, number one, um, we've got location. I don't think it's a good idea to be too aggressively shorting in here. I don't like the idea of shorting in green boxes. Yeah, the market can go down a bit further, 
But then it can also just spike violently away from you and you get totally trapped. So keep that in mind. Secondly, indicator confirmation. And ideally, you know, kind of like I showed you on that bear scenario, uh, we really should have been looking at this market and going, oh boy, this looks ugly. Bear divergences. So and through here to actually start seeing that, yes, this is uh, bullish and we should be thinking uppy, we actually want to see things like the RSI indicator um, actually making um, higher lows. Now we just did that. I'm not quite sure whether that move down there negates all of this uh, bullish uh, sort of constructive behavior. RSI got down to 20, there's 20.36. And here we got down to 24, well, that's good. So we didn't break to new lows. Price itself did break to new lows. So I think you can still say that that is, it's building divergence. Interestingly enough, uh, there's a, I think there's a big difference between what's called, in my, and this is my teaching, uh, the difference between confirmed divergence and potential divergence. Since this low is lower than these lows, all of this sort of potential divergence that you saw building up through here, unfortunately, it's been negated. So now you have to draw your line there. And really, this becomes confirmed divergence when we go up through that high there. So this RSI has got to break out through the top there. Then we will see that this actually has made a big W. And that's really what you want to see is you want to see big W's in your indicator. And yet price is making lower lows. That's And all that does is it just says, hey, you know what? The indicators are actually saying this thing's a lot stronger than what price itself is leading you to believe. Kind of like what you see here, right? Uh, in this case, we were making higher highs. And you can see the indicator was actually making lower highs. And I actually think the indicator went into a confirmed divergence right there, where it broke through that low, right there. So this event right here was actually your tell that the bull was pretty much done. And then interestingly enough, you can kind of see choppy, 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 uh-oh, fail. And then all hell broke loose from here on out. And actually, it would be interesting. That was May of last uh, year. Yeah, my birthday. All right. And actually, uh, interestingly enough, for the record, it's not Brian's birthday that actually stops the bull. It turns out that it's Chris all along who's, who's actually the guy who causes all this to happen. So don't blame it next time on Brian. That's false. It's all Brian's fault. <laughs> <laughs> I like, hey, at least, at least that's my way I can test whether Chris is paying attention or not. <laughs> all right. So point here is, uh, do we have a confirmed bullish divergence here? Yeah, and you're right, Richard. Probably a lot easier. Hell, why don't we split the difference? Let's go a three-day chart. I see a lot of people doing three-day charts these days. And uh, I think they're pretty handy as well. So there's a three-day chart. Same sort of thing. You can see the wicked divergence. And I mean, look at this little top right in there. I mean, you want a trade setup. Uh, where's the circle? Anyway, right there. That right there looks to me like that was the poop. So RSI fails right there. RSI is pushing to new highs. You can see there's a cute little div that came in right there. Uh, if you had the balls, uh, that would have been like the trade of the year right there. Uh, talk about an uber uh, um, uh, indicator signal. And trade location. Are we in areas where you should be thinking that maybe the market's a little toppy? Yeah, I mean, hell, 
even the 200 period moving average here as a return to the mean was saying that price was like about twice what the mean was. And sure enough, boom, right down into there. And actually, I kind of like that as an interesting notice. Look at that. 38.2, there's Colin just sitting there waiting for us. In fact, you know, this might be another one at Tony Grazie, or what is it? How does that guy go again? Oh. Tony Vese, we go down to 1K. I could see Novogratz, I, and the question ultimately is, does Novogratz get out of the penalty box? Because he got into a lot of trouble with that Luna story. But notice how, okay, could we have Novogratz come out and say, yeah, Bitcoin, because keep in mind, this is what he said before. I see Bitcoin 40 Gs. So how ironic he could come out and say, I still see Bitcoin 40 Gs. And look at, there's Colin and the dump chasers. They're just sitting there. And there's a 200 period moving average, a return to the mean on, uh, on the three day chart. So I can very easily see that. And that's basically what this is. Right? We can see that happen again. There's no reason why that can. In fact, you might even argue, uh, you know, that when I talk to people about TA and stuff, I often say that uh, we want to look for where the bull uh, stopped and where, because remember, institutions sell up markets. So somebody had to stop all the kids' enthusiasm and actually sell into that. And that's probably the level that they're going to defend in the future. And so I think that that is that level. And in the le in our education program, we call this the institutional fingerprint. And actually, I did a uh, tweet about this the other day, which I thought was a you know it's very well uh, articulated. And actually, there's a couple things that I've mentioned here today that I think actually uh, oh I did this again. Jeez, I gotta look at what time it is. Where the hell did two hours just disappeared? And I didn't even. Uh, uh, I swear my life is so frustrating right now. Anyway, kind of wasted a lot of time. I hope you guys got some value out of all this. <laughs> I always say that over and over. Uh, all right, yeah, this one. So this is the same logic. There's uh, Mr. Gan. He would do his 50% retracement over the past year. So interestingly enough, that's about 36,000. That's his 50% level. But uh, I believe that here is your floor. So somebody was selling, 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 selling. Somebody said, no more selling. You go up. So I think that makes an institutional fingerprint right there. And I actually think that's probably where they're bringing the market right back to. There's Mr. Dixon and his 80% correction from the peak. But notice, and I really like using these moving averages to sort of help me identify trend. And you notice the moving averages are still very, very bearishly pointing. Uh, it's interesting, somebody on here on these comments goes, now just show me when it, uh, you think Bitcoin uh, is going to zero, and then I'll know that the bottom is in. <laughs> so go figure. Okay, so location, check. Indicator confirmation? Nah, I don't think so. I don't think, in fact, like I said, we just did some serious technical damage with this dump here. So I don't think we have indicator confirmation yet. Um, my favorite indicator confirmation for this concept called divergence is actually not, this is a, this is a price oscillator. So it's it's not really it's it's more designed to identify overbought and oversold versus uh, momentum divergence. It works well in identifying divergence. Sometimes RSI goes a little screwy though. Kind of like my comment there about um, moving averages. Uh, I'm a big fan of the MACD study, but it's a very, very um, altered MACD. I don't, I never like to take signals right out of the box. I think that's always dangerous to use these tools because everybody else is looking at the signals right out of the box. And of course, uh, anytime uh, you're taking trades that everybody else is taking trades, it's the danger of you know walking into a, a crowded mar trade and usually the crowded trade gets run over. So what I actually like to do, and this is what we teach in our education program, is um, I will put away the 
basic signals. Uh, let's see what I got here. And I will just concentrate on the histogram. I like to, and this is just me, I like the histogram to look a little bit crisper, so I speed up the fast signal and I slow down the slow signal. It's just Brian, but you see it didn't change it a hell of a lot, but it did make it a little crisper. Here's a really good example though of uh, just because you have a divergence, that doesn't necessarily mean that there is a trade. Uh, and a lot of people get into a lot of trouble uh, just taking like a, a trade off of just one signal. So here's an example. You can see the histogram itself made lower highs there and then there. Uh, but you tell me, is this uh, divergence actually confirmed or is it still potential? I don't know whether you were listening to me earlier. The answer is it's still potential. In fact, you could even argue that that looks like a bit of a momentum wedge. And I hate when MACD makes these wedges. Oh boy, all hell can break loose. <laughs> and sure enough, you know, what ends up happening is you get these whipshaw moves, right? Look at this whipshaw action. If you were like, oh, that's a bear dip, I'm going to short that, and wham, you got slammed out. Oh, thank you very much. Confirms here. Notice, price actually went to new highs. Wow, what the hell? I want my money back. Call my lawyer. You were supposed to give me that one signal that was supposed to guarantee to make money. So it just goes to show, don't ever take... And this is where I see a lot of people on the YouTube and all this. And I, this is just a warning to all of you who are watching this. I don't know how we can get this message out. I watch these kids, you know, they'll do things like, oh yeah, you get a man divergence in your indicator and that's a guy short. And look at this one trade, you made 327%. And then the next trade, oh, you get stopped out. And hey, but this one, I mortgaged my house. So now I'm wiped out and I don't have a home. Well, too bad. I mean, I suppose you could argue there is an M in price, which led to that short trade there. I don't know whether that would have been really that attractive profit-wise. There's that big move we talked about. In fact, uh, you can see the divergence really, really well here. Right? Look at that, Bosch. And then I would actually say that this divergence actually confirmed here on the break there. So that's as of here. Now the momentum is officially in divergence. You want to hunt for reasons to get short. Like I said, there was that institutional fingerprint. And I, ironically enough, I think this actually is even um, it's a half decent. This is sort of a level three program because I don't like uh, telling new people to trading this kind of trading. But that's like a harmonic pattern. And so that inside bar failure is actually a really good short setup trade. But eh, that's here nor there. Point here is just that uh, up here, okay, you know, look for your indicators, uh, you know, uh, location, we're definitely at top end of the range, uh, indicator confirmation, great, now look for some sort of price structure to get short. Down here though, now, and, and this is the question uh, right now is, do we have any bullish indications here? And unfortunately, we have the smatterings, you can see they're trying I got a nice little bull div right here. But this, again, is a good testament why you don't want to just take one reason for a trade. If you had bought this, you would have been like, okay, well, okay, all right, okay. Oh, what the hell? Oh, what? The, okay, what the? Oh, what the? Oh, what the? What are you doing to me? Oh, no. Ah, well, I'm dead. So, uh, she tried. Had location, had indicator confirmation. And I, you know, I often fall into this trap, especially when I'm day trading, is I will front run this indicator confirmation. But notice that this thing didn't actually turn up until here. So it's only here, as of here, that I can actually start hunting Ws. And you notice that, okay, it's making higher highs, but that's not really very W-ish. I mean, if anything, we, you know, like if we change this to a line chart, watch how the uh, Ws just disappear. There's the W there. But that W confirmed the bull div. Okay, fine. So now show me a W. And we just don't get much. I mean, you, yeah, you get higher highs. But now 
look how far away we are from that low. And sure enough, we have to roll over. What I wanted to see here for this to be legit is up, then down, test that low, then put in a W and away we go. And you notice it just didn't do it. I mean, we had a bit of a W over here, but by the time we get to over here, notice we actually have bearish structure working here. It's really, really messy. I might even argue that you got this big honking bull div that's potential down here, right? That right there. But remember I had said earlier, I hate when I see these momentum wedges. That's what that looks like to me. And unfortunately, what usually happens with these big wedges like this is we'll go up and then we'll go down. Blech. So I'm a little worried that, you know, unfortunately, we do have a breakdown actually happening here in front of us. Uh, a little worried that we're going to get like a little bit of a pop up here, maybe into the end of the year, January, something like that. Uh, and then we've got all hell is going to break loose next uh, first, second quarter of next year. I'm hearing a lot of people in the broader economy and stuff. Uh, jokingly on the site, we have uh, Chris's girlfriend. We'll just call her Mrs. Booth. Um, um, she uh, She's not overly optimistic for the first quarter, second quarter of the um, of uh, 2023 so enjoy this little window while it lasts the only problem is has the window already closed <laughs> and it might have why do i say that um we built these uh, proprietary uh trading tools and this is based off of sort of my life's work and uh interestingly enough i even put a tweet out uh, yesterday morning I woke up and I was like, all right, let's go and buy crypto. Yeah, let's all, we're all going to get rich. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I pulled up the, uh, the dashboard and lo and behold, you look at the dashboard and it's just like, uh oh, um, and I really like, I think this dashboard now, especially for you crypto people, this crypto, there's the overall market. And I mean, look at that. That looks like a train wreck. Oh, Jesus H Christ. That looks very, very bad. <laughs> uh, and the fact that we're like slipping through these lows, right? Remember, if we're going to use this, this is going to be our reason number two, indicators. That's what this is. This is an indicator. What letter of the alphabet does that look like? Right? That's a big fat M. Up, down, up, fail. Uh-oh. That's not good. And interestingly enough, uh, I even put out a uh, message about the Dow. Yeah, even, uh, well, we'll get to that in a moment. No, oh, I guess I don't have it on here. Um, but I even had uh, the Dow. Look at the Dow Jones Industrials. That looks horrible. Transports looks horrible. Oh, my goodness. So... Uh, you know, and as I said there a moment ago, we've put together now this, uh, this crypto breadth and it's such a pretty layout. God, it's so gorgeous. There's the S&P 500 and we have one site member actually who's like, I only take trades when I see that the S&P 500 is bullish and crypto breadth is bullish. And when I see that scenario, I got to go all in. And I got to say, we had a beautiful signal there back sort of the end of um, uh, October, beginning of November. I mean, it was just absolutely textbook uh, in the stock market. I mean, I'll scroll back, see if I can show you in the Twitter feed. I mean, the signals were just absolutely beautiful, especially in the Dow. The Dow is just absolutely perfect. Uh, and actually it even set up just an absolutely perfect trade. So. This is, you know, and think, I mean, it's great seeing this work because, like I said, it's my life's work. So uh, our histogram flashing majorly oversold signals on both the country funds, which are basically all the international equity funds and the S&P 500. There is the Dow Jones Industrial oversold. Nice W's coming in. And what was fascinating is you go on social media right around this point and basically everybody's saying that the sky's falling. 
So here was that signal back uh, sort of the end of September. We spent October sort of mulling, 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 and then we broke out here um, sort of middle of October, end of October kind of idea. Uh, market started moving up smartly, and that was basically this trade. Now, like I said, the market actually uh, got egregiously overbought into this move here, and you might even argue indicator confirmation. If we go and look at that signal, given the way that the breadth looks right now, you can see we're making lower highs and lower lows, uh, and yet the stock market itself was actually making higher highs and higher lows. Uh, there, so that was that trade. Now it's cool about this, and I actually just tweeted this out. Actually, I'm surprised I didn't see that. Maybe I didn't. Maybe I just put it on the lounge. Probably should have tweeted it out, but oh well. So there was that topping signal uh, in the stock market right up there. That, ironically enough, was there. So here's a good example where your indicators are making lower highs, lower lows. The breadth indicator is a beautiful, think of it as the strength of the market. And this is basically saying that the strength of the market is waning. There's so much inertia, though, in the market that it keeps pressing to new highs and fascinating. We just came up, what did we say? What was the odds that this gap was going to be filled in at some point down the road? 91%. So, geez whiz, what a surprise. The market worked its way up into that level. Uh, this is a liquidity pool right up here. Remember we talked about institutional fingerprints. Where do institutionals stop the uh, the uh, the bull? Uh, what's the evidence right there? But what I think happened here was that basically there's a whole bunch of stop loss orders just above this level. So ding, 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 they trigger all the stops. And there's really no new buying here. You can see that's as of this point, breadth is actually emming out and looks bad. And so what a surprise, once they clean out all those stop loss orders, the market just starts cascading lower. Interesting, we're coming into an FOMC event here, and we also have a really big options, uh, and options, futures, indexes, and options on indexes, whole bunch of derivatives are all expiring here on Friday the 16th of December. So what I actually think is going to happen, and somebody, uh, you know, write this down if, you, uh, if you're interested. What I think is going to happen here is we're going to have the Fed meeting. It's going to be ugly on the other side of it. I think they're going to rally the market into the Fed meeting. And that's sort of what I had done uh, for site people, uh, but I might have gotten rid of it. Was it off of, I thought I did this here. Maybe up here. Ah, uh, <laughs> yeah, there's no comment on Trex. <laughs> it looks like Trex is up to their old games. Uh, where did I do this? Oh, you know where I did it? I did it over here. Uh, not that one. Hey, there we go. <clears throat> so... You know, uh, crypto-wise, uh, uh, it looks to me like we're obeying this trend line fairly well. So uh, if we think sort of trend channels, I mean, I can't tell how this is going to resolve, but it does look like a little bit of an AB equals CD kind of thing. Um, so I had actually drawn the ABCD off of those lows. Um, I like the idea of the market pushing up into this Fed event. Uh, you can see my little sine wave. And maybe a, I wouldn't be surprised, though, if on the other side of the Fed event and through this funny expiration window, we actually have all hell breaks loose. Now, having said that, if we go breaking down through here, then this thesis will be put on hold. So uh, if we go and M out through that level right there, 1736. Uh, then we're probably going to work our way back down against these lows. Probably eat that tail right down in there. Candle body lows for trade location, all that kind of talk. 
Well, we'll see how it goes. Yeah, you're right, David. It looks like uh, somebody stopped the bull here. Although I do notice that when I do do these videos, quite often the market moves one direction. Then I'll finish the video. I'll go out with Liam and then uh, come back and we see the markets firmed up. So let's just watch how it acts against that uh, 70, 36, 9. And our rule, of course, about trend lines, uh, although this looks a little bit off. Uh, let's see. What's our, did, Are we supposed to take a trade at a trend line? And even at a trend line break, is that generally in our best interest? Um, not quite sure where that's being drawn off of. Let's go there. Uh, oh, that's not it. Darn. I don't know where that. Oh. We go there to there. Hey, there we go. All right. Uh, all right. So boom, boom, boom. Uh, would it be a good idea to just take a trade on that break right there? I don't think so. I think that's asking for trouble. So if anything, you know, if you are bearish, there's nothing wrong with that. I wouldn't be surprised if this is like an A, B, C, D, which takes us down into sort of like a measured move of that. All right, boom, 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 boom. It's probably not the best tool to use. Let's get rid of some of this stuff. Uh, look at that. Even as I'm speaking, somebody's like, oh, shit, he's on to us. All right, bring the price back. <laughs> we can't sucker him into going, hey, sell that. Sell it. Sell it. You're going to make lots of money. And then, of course, it's a trap. Right? <laughs> uh, anyway, so the point here is that trend line based off of that validated market structure. And this is why uh, trend line identification is so important as you you do have to validate your trend lines with market structure so I believe that this trend line is valid because we actually went through uh, that level right there that movement there validates this trend line so anyway uh, why cough check remember we talked about that earlier so that's pretty important level right in there so Point being, if they did bring the market down into here, I could very easily see that this is nothing more than just uh, uh, A to B and C to D down into there. But we have a rule at TRI, we're not allowed to short this break. If this really is a top, then we will break it then we will come back and we'll check the original breakout. If you want to trade the original breakout, fine. I think that's still a bit aggressive. I actually would prefer that you wait for a market structure signal on the other side of this trend line. And that's your sell. Now sometimes, you know, I will, I will fully acknowledge sometimes uh, you'll get the, you know, you'll get a big honk and rally. Uh, you sometimes actually right back to this trend line, uh, like that, and then sometimes the actual failure will be nothing more than just an inside bar on the other side of uh, that rally, and so uh, there is your new sell signal there. But the point here is. You don't want to take the trade just on the break because this is often a trap. There's so many people in the public that are all watching this line and they all have an emotional reaction that quite often it happens, the public sells, and then the price just stops. And what's worse is that you don't realize that all they did was they just, they used your liquidity as the public to get, you know, sell, 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 to get the price to actually come down into their buying window. And these, you know, the professional traders, whoever the hell they are, they're actually buying your sell order. I've seen that happen a gazillion times, and I hate it when that happens. Trust me, and that's from personal experience. <laughs> so all I'm going to say with regard to this is just wait, you know, let this trend line break. And if it's for real, it'll break. And then just if you are thinking short and you're thinking down, well, then just wait. Give me some sort of 
sell signal price structure wise on the other side of this trend line so anyway i'll leave that at that uh okay so uh where the hell was i hope you guys are enjoying this rant here today sure is uh ten tangential <laughs> i know a lot of people like using that word um oh you know what i'm supposed to be doing here today i'm supposed to be actually answering your questions so what time is it? it's 12 37 I have to be on the road by one uh, fifteen, so we got basically about a half hour, 45 minutes trying to answer some of your questions. Uh, I, I mean, the whole point of why I went down that rabbit hole to begin with was I wanted you guys... Um, oh, where did I do that? Did I do that over here? Yeah. I wanted you guys just to sort of get a 65,000 foot view or... 40,000 foot view, 30,000 foot view, whatever, of, of the story right now. And like the message that I put out, uh, and actually the easiest way for you to see this is I'll just throw on all my regular indicators and uh, the moving averages, which, like I said, I swear by them. I've used them forever. They're simple. They're not, don't overthink this. Just what's the relationship between the 13 EMA and the 30 SMA on the weekly price chart? And, you know, they're still pointing down. Um, so location, awesome. Uh, indicator confirmation, no, nope, don't have it yet. Uh, price, and if we don't have, and you can use moving averages as an indicator confirmation. You know, do you want to wait for the moving average to turn up? You see how it turned up here? That was a beautiful entry there. Um, I mean, you might have waited till over here. You missed that ridiculously low price, but you can see when the moving average turned up, you rode that entire bull run all the way up there. So is there any huge hurry here to call a bottom on Bitcoin? I don't think so. Um, and unfortunately, that was the message. I, I like these little tools. These are super cool. And if anything, this makes sense, right? Look at all the potential b divergences. We have a whole bunch of potentials. We only got three confirmed divs. We got one in chicken money flow. And I don't, I guess, uh, this says one. I'm not sure why that says three there. Maybe because of this over here. Um, but potential, 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 confirmed, potential, potential. Tons of potential, but just not confirmed. Uh, and really, I might even say, you know, you look at these moving averages, you can see that they're tightening up. Volatility is coming out of the price. It's just they haven't turned up yet. What we really want to see here and really what should happen is this should be like a saucer bottom. And what's interesting is if we go back to uh, uh, Ben's uh, mathematical, uh, when should we expect Bitcoin to turn based on happening events? There's that saucer bottom. And keep in mind, right, this is through, uh, you know, this is a longer term. That's a weekly price chart. If anything, you know, I won't do it now. You know, tune in next Wednesday. Hopefully we'll do our crypto show. Uh, but what we should see is that we are in this window here right now, which means we are in the bottoming window. Now, if you're one of those type of people that are like, Brian, I don't want to overthink this. You know, I'll put myself on a dollar cost averaging plan. I just want to buy cheap assets. I don't want to buy expensive assets. And I know that the happening events coming up down the road a couple of years. I'm more than happy just to sit on this asset for the next couple of years and just wait until the next happening event, right? We know usually once the happening event comes, we're in a brand new bull cycle. So something like over there. I have no problem whatsoever if you're like, Brian, I'm starting my dollar cost averaging plan anywhere down in this green box. And maybe once a month, once a couple months, I'm just going to go and do a little nanny nibble. Nothing wrong with that whatsoever. But just understand, look how long we sat in this green box this time. And you see, eventually we worked our way out. And if you had an average cost anywhere in this green box down here on the rally up into mountain man level there, you got your double, you got all your original capital back, you got a whole bunch of free coins, and you just sit there. I have no risk on this trade whatsoever. I don't care what it does. And, you know, after the happening event, all hell breaks loose and, you know, Lambo Central. 
So that's what I would love to see all of you do. But is this quote unquote a buy here today? I don't think so. Not yet. You're just going to have to be patient. And we never even got talked into the point. I mean, ideally what we want to see is we want to see W's in price. I don't see any W's here. Maybe it goes something like that. You know? so. Okay, I think I'm going to leave the uh, this. Uh, what's that? False advertising? I don't think it will affect Bitcoin is also developing during this time. All right. Uh, Eddie, of course, wants to try and throw a wrench into my whole argument here. <laughs> what I, I, I definitely, and this is the same thing I said through all this, is seeing a rally back to things like WD GAN's 50% rule over the coming cycle is an absolute no-brainer. Exactly when is it going to happen? I can't tell you that. Nobody can. Is it going to happen? I would say it's an absolute no-brainer. Now, what you have to understand is that the bottom of this FIB study, whoops, not that one, this one, it's going to be based on wherever the ultimate lowest low comes in. We don't even know if that's the lowest low. But interesting, notice, look at that 50% level in my magic circle there. Even if we have to go all the way down to 88.6, notice, well, magic circle, well, that's not really very far off. So can you accumulate down here and look to sell on that 50% bounce, get that risk-free trade going? Hell, you'll even make some money, get a whole bunch of free Bitcoins, throw them on a USB device, bury it in your backyard, and then after the happening event, if the whole damn thing goes crazy and Bitcoin goes to a million bucks, well, you're made in the shade. You got, and it was free. No risk whatsoever. I mean, that's the way smart money plays this game. Can you do that? I'd love to help you if you need some help building the plan. That's the whole reason why we built the course and the whole school program. So food for thought. There you go. Merry Christmas. Okay, let's get on to those questions. And then, like I said, in a half an hour, I got to hop. Head on out to Liam. And uh, thank you very much for all your positive thoughts uh, with regard to Liam. He's doing pretty well these days. So he's a pretty happy camper. He loves his car rides. Uh, so uh, we better make damn sure uh, Brian arrives on time. Gives him a big fat car ride. Uh, <clears throat> there's a bunch of questions that were asked uh, last week. I don't know whether I got to them. Unfortunately, our school instructor actually uh, has a power outage uh, where he is So uh, for the level one program. So he, he's delayed today's class. So I can understand there's probably not a lot of questions here. We actually did a free for all Friday kind of thing. And I just said, hey, you know what? Throw in some uh, questions. Uh, and I sat there and I blabbed away for three fucking hours and I never even answered a question. <laughs> so let's see if I can try and answer these in the next half hour. So, um, so let's get the, uh, there's only one question here uh, from the students. So let's see. Can you please explain the rationale behind quote unquote investing? If a person is a good trader, why would they lock up their money long term in an investment? Wouldn't it be better to use it to trade? Uh, that's a good point. The let's see how to, how would I best answer this? I believe that you should always take a risk first approach to everything that you do in uh, the market, and that really the majority of your nest egg and and your you know even retirement funds and all that. All of that stuff should be in assets that don't go anywhere. So, you know, owning your own home, I think, is a good idea. I'm not really a big fan of huge mortgages. And I really don't like the mortgages where you put a down payment on, but all you're doing on the mortgage is paying interest. And at the end of the term, there's a big fat, uh, you know, balloon payment due for the original money that you borrowed. Uh, I'm not a fan of that kind of stuff. In fact, I might even argue that in today's environment, that's a trap. Um, so 
investing should really be more of something like I'm putting my money into this asset that I know has value and that it ain't going anywhere. And ideally, an investment should actually spit out a passive income for you. So, you know, people who buy real estate and uh, rent the houses out, you know, now you can buy a uh, real estate and Airbnb the place out, which I think is that that's a game changer for our society. And if I was actually going to invest in a, in a company, I mean, I haven't really looked into the fundamentals, so I don't know what the valuations are like right now. But the, I really like the idea. I didn't even realize Airbnb was an actual company. I thought it was just sort of like a a sort of a, an internet phenomenon that people were doing. But I actually really like the idea of if there's a company that actually quarterbacks that whole Airbnb thing and they actually can like uh, make a, some sort of barrier to entry for competition against them, that would actually be a really good business model. I'll tell you, we did very, very well in Portugal with our Airbnbs. I think the people who owned the houses were very happy. Um, and I think everybody that went on the trip with us was extremely happy. Um, a lot of people invest in stock. Um, and most good quality stocks actually pay dividends. So it's a passive income generating uh, investment. Of course, you invest in government bonds and they pay you a coupon. All right, an interest payment. Um, so I think the idea there is you want you're investing your money in something that you know is not going to disappear tomorrow. Uh, ideally, of course, as rational investors, we're going to try and invest in value, and then we're going to use technical analysis to help time our purchases. Um, let's say, you know, and actually, you know, where the, this comes down to is, uh, let's see if I can show you this in our level one program, a good financial advisor, um, question is where the heck do I have it? There we are. A good financial advisor is actually going to sit down with you and they're going to come up with probably a bunch of plans. Um, ideally, you know, there's two rules to investing. And, you know, if any of these people that are in hot water in the marketplace had listened to Brian and had followed Brian's two trading rules, there wouldn't be any problems. Do Quan shit would have never happened. In fact, I actually came out the other side of the Luna trade very well. I, uh, I think I got maybe about a 5x on my investment after getting all of my original capital back in my pocket. I did really well on Luna. I don't have any problems with that. The people that just blindly bought and and just didn't think about it from a rational perspective, and you know, as long as the asset keeps going higher, then technically their net worth keeps going higher, and they're look how smart and wealthy I am, Brian. Well, those people failed. They did exactly the wrong thing. It's the reason why I build these two rules of investing. Um, and unfortunately, on the way up, you get the, um, the, um, how do you do this? On the way up, you get the three arrows capital. Does everybody know the three arrows capital? And those cocksuckers, uh, right in the middle of the bull market, when I'm like banging out doubles, doing the right thing, conservative, not greedy, just running my small business of trading, making money from trading, Keep in mind, I've never lost money. Never. I don't lose money. I make money. <laughs> I don't give the market money. 
This is my fucking money. I worked hard for it. I'm not going to go and just give it to the market. And if it means that if I'm doing shitty trading, then I'm going to dial things back. I'm going to take less risk, less risk, less risk until I start seeing either a market state that's favorable to me, i.e. bull markets again, or uh, I start to actually see my trade setups are working and I'm disciplined and I'm patient and I'm running my trading plan correctly. Well, then I can start uh, raising risk. But the point here is I start everything, everything risk first approach. And Brian's second rule of investing is don't put more than 5% of your stake at risk in any one single investment. Just don't ever do it. So uh, I think the number, you know, and, you know, it all comes back to, you know, what did, what did Mrs. Jones in grade three you know, um, don't put all your eggs in one basket. I don't know. Do they teach that in grade three? <laughs> Maybe your mom taught you that. I don't know. That's basically that 5% rule, right? Diversification. Uh, I might argue that actually you should not only be diversified amongst different assets, but even within the asset classes, you can diversify your risk by running different types of trading plans. You know, I, there's a lot of people that make the case that you should have a chunk of gold in your portfolio. There, are, There's also the case that you can make the argument that gold goes through bull and bear cycles. So you could make the argument that there is a case to be made to be an investor in gold and just have a chunk of it in your portfolio as a hedge. And there's also a case to be made that, you know, when gold happens to be in bull cycles, that, hey, if you can go clip the market for a couple bucks trading it, go for it. And you should build different plans that address those different types of markets. But you should be insanely diversified across the entire investment and perspective or spectrum. Everything from uh, non-risk assets, things like debt instruments and cash, to more riskier assets, things like real estate and equity, to absolutely insanely risky assets, things like commodities and cryptocurrencies. <laughs> so, you know, I... I don't know how else to describe it. You know, if you go all in on quote-unquote trading, um... You can get rich really quickly. You can also get wrecked really quickly. And if anything, what I like to do is I like to assume that I'm stupid, that I'm going to make mistakes. In fact, what I do like to do, which is kind of weird, but I'm a masochist and by nature, is I like to actually put a trade on and assume it's, it's going to lose. And then the very first question I'm going to ask myself is, okay, if this thing loses, how bad is it going to hurt? Now, if you can do that with your portfolio and you're just trading and you're religious about following, you know, strict stop losses and, and uh, you know, risk more than, say, 1% or 2% of your stake on any one single trade and you just keep trading and building up your capital, at some point, your portfolio is going to get big enough that you're going to be like, you know, maybe I should put a little bit of this money aside, you know. Uh, it It's tough to keep coming back <clears throat> with a trading account that's like a million dollars. And, you know, you got to risk like 10,000 bucks on a on a on a four hour Bitcoin trade. That gets a little challenging. <laughs> I mean, you could do it, I suppose, but. What I've often found happens, and I think it's easiest, is you go and make a bunch of money. Let's say uh, one of your little crypto ideas goes zooming up, and you it's you know it's you put a thousand bucks into it, goes a hundred x, it's now a hundred g's. Well, maybe take fifty grand of that and just go throw it into like a T bill or something, or like a heaven forbid a government bond or something like that, and then you know it's not going anywhere. Maybe you work with the other fifty grand, whatever. Um, but diversification, right? Just trying to spread the risk. It, you know, ideally what it's meant to do is try and keep the hair on the top of your head. 
trying to keep you from going gray. And then what usually ends up happening in the markets, which absolutely sucks horse cocks, but it happens every 20 years, you can literally set your watch to it, is quite everything will go absolutely insane up. And of course, you know, there's only idiots like Brian who are like, hey, you better cool your jets. You better, you know, play it, play it close to the vest, diversify, right? Don't take too much risk. Remember, three arrows are like, buy more, buy more, buy more, buy more. Keep buying, keep buying. You know, there's even a student of mine who, oh, it broke my heart to hear him say it, right? Uh, technical analysis doesn't matter. Just keep buying. You'll get rich. And every 20 years, you get one of these. Yeah, I can. Um, and it's interesting, actually, because there's a gentleman on our site, and I make reference to him because it's a really fun reference. Uh, but basically, and uh, now I'm blabbing away again, wasting a lot of time. I, I don't know. Does this help at all with this question? I hope it does. But um, he, uh, he sees a lot of similarities between uh, what he sees in this particular cycle and what happened in the dot-com boom. And I remember I showed you Bernie Madoff and all that. There's no difference. I mean, ironically enough, uh, Amazon's coming off in this cycle too in this market. Interesting. Oh, what? Amazon's not $3,600 a share anymore? Like, isn't that bizarre how they do that to us? Like, why the fuck was the price of the stock so high there? It's kind of ridiculous. Anyway, um, but last cycle... Right, this is what Amazon looked like. Now, does that look slightly familiar? And if if this is the way that particular 20-year cycle ended, does maybe Bitcoin have to go through this same kind of bottoming process? You're all assuming that Bitcoin is bottomed here. I don't think Bitcoin is bottomed here. I don't think it's bottomed by a long shot. You know, if we do our simple 13 EMA, uh, conversation, weekly price chart, where did the moving averages actually cross back up? Right here. And maybe a little bit right there, but we never did W out, so that was a bit of a head fake. But if we are sort of like comparatively speaking, kind of like right here, it almost looks like something like that, eh? Uh, I don't know, that's a tough one. Anyway, something like that. Um, then that means we're sort of like right here. And if that's the case, then that means this correction still, you know, all you dollar cost averagers, you think they, oh my God, I'm going to miss the boat. I'm going to miss the boat. Well, I mean, if we look at Mr. Uh, Bezos, that's 61 weeks. I mean, here we are here. Is that, is that where we are in this darn thing? Uh, actually, it'd be interesting. Where's the? Oh, I guess this didn't have a 200 period moving average yet. That's too bad. That would have been cool to see. But um, you know, I don't know something along those lines. Uh, are we like right here? And notice, look at that December of 2000. It's remarkable how similar this is. Like, you know, I remember distinctly through here the fall of 2000. This was when the rubber really hit the road with the dot-com blow-ups. Like it was the, everybody was promised, like in March of 2000, everybody was all obsessed with the Y2K bullshit. And nobody was really, in fact, I even remember there was a little girl on CNBC that came out with a $1,000 price target for this stock Rambus. And I don't even think Rambus even trades anymore. But uh, it was the fall of that year where the shit really hit the fan. This is when Pets.com blew up and all that. So if you figure that we're in that same sort of period, and gee whiz, doesn't this price chart look very similar? Looks pretty similar to me. Okay, so here we are in December. Let's push this forward. So there's December, December 11th. And you see, this is where the moving average is turned up, where I think, you know, you can start seeing this looks like an inverted head and shoulders. I don't know whether you can see this or not. Do 
You see how these daily briefs can go on for three hours? Because if I just get let loose, I could talk here for another two or three hours. <laughs> I mean, I could just keep going and going and going. Oh, God, it drives you crazy. Anyway, so, uh, you know, is this what we have to go through? I, I don't mind that thinking, you know. I actually think that that's pretty accurate. So if that's the case, then, you know, don't be in a big hurry here, folks. Oh, something along those lines. Right. I mean, I have to, you know, the guy's name's Eddie. Um, and uh, if I'm really, really lucky, I'm going to be able to open up a, a little, a, a, maybe a and b with him over there in Portugal. And we'll have fun uh, r chasing around vacas. But this was his thinking. And I have to say, that's that's pretty damn good thinking. It's pretty spot on. And you can make the argument that the inertia of the market, actually, I'm a bull, look at me, right? That didn't actually come in until way over here. Oh, God, look how fucking far away that is. And what a surprise. Didn't we say something's supposed to happen in Bitcoin land in, in like April, May of 2024? Uh, if we actually look at previous happening cycles, Bitcoin kind of goes like that, and then it goes woohoo. <laughs> so I wouldn't be surprised if we have something that's like that. So, but anyway, if we do this same um, concept, we don't really need to get bullish of Bitcoin again until probably the fall of 2024. Oh, Jesus Christ. So now, is that going to sell a lot of newsletters? Is that going to sell a lot of subscriptions? Probably not. So you can see why I don't do that well in this uh, shill game. I'm <laughs> just telling you the truth. It's going to be a slog, folks. And actually, you know what? That's that's not a bad comparison. If I was going to say a chart of the day, that's it. So, you know, here's the question. Uh, we said that, you know, location-wise, nanny nibbles. Don't break Brian's two rules of investing. Interestingly enough, had you come in, let's say uh, you did the same thing on Amazon. You think that Amazon's a buy here. There's the 50% rule. So uh, what does that say? $3.30. Keep in mind this is on a split adjusted basis. So it's $9. That's a triple. So you notice that, yeah, uh, pretty good odds that uh, triple. But, you know, to the ultimate bottom, uh, I actually had to go through the pain of seeing this go down 72% from where I bought. So here we are, 18,000. What's 72% drop? And you're all going, shut the fuck up, Brian. Jesus, what are you, an asshole? Uh, that's down there. So what does that take? Oh, 4,500 bucks. <laughs> Ouch. Uh, I know you guys don't want to see that. That's for sure. Uh, anyway, I mean, I don't know. I'm not going to, I'm not in the business of predicting the future. I'm just simply telling you that, you know, you don't know what the hell this bottom's going to look like here. We have not bottomed yet. So just to blindly declare that, yes, this is the bottom, that's a bit dangerous. But you see, did uh, Mr. Bezos' stock work its way back up to 50% rules? Did it work back to the point where you could sell half on a double? Remember, we bought at 92 cents. Now, it turns out that ultimately the 50% rule actually was $2.94. And look at that, son of a gun. Yeah, that's ridiculous, eh? So... Let's say, hypothetically, we did have to go all the way down to 4,500 and all of you are going, oh my God, you're crazy. Um, well, what's a 50% level from there to there? That's 36. Now we say we're buying at 16, 17, 18 right now. Oh, what a coincidence. That's going to be double our purchase price. So... I mean, I'm not saying Bitcoin's going to go down to four Gs. That would destroy all of you, I'm sure. If it did have to go all the way down there, probably half of you watching this video 
probably will not be watching and you'll be cursing Bitcoin under your breath for the rest of your life. But anywhere down in here, it, wherever the hell the bottom comes in, can you see how the 50% rule, it doesn't really move that much. It looks like our next counter trend rally is just going to be a revisit of these lows. Just like, can you see how this rally was nothing more than a kiss of that low from the other side? Can you see that? Wyckoff check. That's just a Wyckoff check going the other direction. Right? You might even argue, what's the odds that this was a fog and bomb? That was 2.618, and then it was just a revisit of the 100 level. I bet probably pretty good. Uh, oh, look at that. <laughs> hey, Eddie, do you see this? Hey, Eddie, I think you could teach a course on this chart. <laughs> I'm so proud of him. When he pulled this up, I was like, damn, you know, you're a next level thinker. Um, uh, Vaca all day. <laughs> Twenty. You know, there's a guy. Uh, you ever see that guy? He's a he's a real fucking opinionated Canadian university professor dude that get all blown up by the the woke people. What the hell's that guy's name? Anyway, all he does is he eats steak and mineral water, and that's it. <laughs> that's the only thing he eats. And I've actually seen him. His complexion is actually getting better. He actually looks healthier. So go figure, right? Eh? Anyway, so uh, this is Amazon. There's your sort of grand prediction following this cycle. 50% uh, levels. Ah, shit, this stuff looks like it just writes itself. So do we want to see what a 2.618 is off of wherever the hell uh, Bitcoin uh, topped out here? Uh, might scare you guys. Let's see what happens. Where is that? Is that, I wonder, is that this? Or is it that this this whole thing? I would suck if it's this whole thing. But let's see, if we go here to here, uh, there's 2.618, so we've already hit that. You guys all go, phew. And there's 2.618, uh-oh, down there. So, anyway, point being, if you are the nanny nibbler and you are investing, well, I don't have a problem down in here. Remember we said Simon Dixon, 80%. I think that you'll get your uh, double off and sell half at 50% level. That's what good investors do. I'll tell you, the absolute best investment you can possibly ever make is if you can buy it, sell half on a double, and that means that the rest of your investment has how much risk associated with it? I mean, to me, that's the best investment ever. There's no risk. Oh boy, what do you got here? Eddie, Eddie Techno, is that T-E-H-N-O? But sir, we are supposed to go to zero, no? <laughs> Uh-oh. Bitcoin dollar, ba-boom, ba-boom. Oh, look at that, nice. Jesus, this Eddie guy, oh, 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 Jesus, oh man. <laughs> Oh, God, don't show this to the crypto kids. They'll freak out. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, it is one one interpretation, that's for sure. Interesting. Uh, that's scary. Eh? Uh, I do like a stab below 10 Gs just to freak out the kids. I do like that. I don't know about down into 1,100. That might be a bit much. But I'll tell you. If somebody comes along and says, uh, well, you know, 51% attack, we're officially taking over the network, <laughs> basically the network's useless. Anyway. Okay. Uh, did I answer the question about should you invest or should you just trade? You know, an investor should look at their portfolio like this. You're spreading out the risk. Jordan Peterson, thank you very much, Cheryl. Um, this is very, very hard for the public to do. They, they, this is why there is a financial planning industry. This is not easy for the public to do. But if you're going to play the game correctly, this is how you play the game. You diversify. And if you can get yourself into a risk-free trade and you want to take that asset and you want to go put it onto a USB device and bury it in your backyard, 
I have nothing wrong with that. No problem with that whatsoever. Call it investing, if you will, totally fine. What I have a real problem with, and this is what usually happens in this game, and it frustrates you to no end, is people will come in and say, oh, I'm going to take a trade here. Then the market collapses, and they say, well, now I'm a long-term investor. Uh, and, you know, we have a cliche when I was a broker, right? Many a short-term trade turn into a long-term investment. It's just the way this silly game goes. Try not to be that person. So I don't know whether that helps answer your question, whoever asked that question, but uh, that's a good question. Uh, so you know, where do I have that tab? And I'm running out of it. Oh, my God, look what time it is. I have to go. Fuck. Ugh. I don't know. Did you guys get any value out of that at all? <laughs> I hope you did. I mean, that's it uh, I can do. You know, unfortunately, uh, not, I mean, I'm, he's my son, right? <laughs> There's no screwing around with that. So my apologies if I completely just wasted a couple hours of your day, but I hope you guys got some value out of that. All right, and I got to leave it at that because uh, no, no waiting on the boy. So uh, PMA for the win. Good luck, everybody in class. Uh, when Grim gets his computer back up and running, um, you know, maybe uh, we'll do like a follow-up um, tomorrow um, for um, for those level one students. You know, just try and remember everybody, we do have the Fed coming up here. Um, and um, I'm expecting some pretty extreme volatility uh, through this Fed event. I think the market's gonna catch a bid into the event then on that event, it's going to be uh, kind of chaotic. So I'm not really too excited about even really doing a hell of a lot in the market right now. I would prefer to see this event get out of the way. Uh, here is sort of my Dow uh, kind of thinking. Uh, these are the Dow futures. I'm looking for a bunch of back and forth. Uh, keep in mind, uh, breadth indicator is now finally cleaning itself up. I think the breadth indicator did absolutely perfect. Uh, it is going through the cleanup process right now. Interestingly enough, fast now on the S&P 500 is already at 36. So, wow, I mean, it's cleaning itself up in a hurry. So, uh, you know, let's get all this washed out through this Fed event. And of course, remember we talked about trend lines earlier. If we can get a break back above the trend line, Let's try and get a nice W on the other side of this trend line. And believe it or not, heading into uh, Christmas and the new year, you know, all of our uh, um, our election year uh, studies, our uh, DCN yield studies, our January barometer studies, they all suggested that actually we're supposed to end the year on a pretty uppy note. So we just got to get through this Fed event. We got to get through... Uh, the big quarterly uh, contract expiry. In fact, uh, there's the chart that uh, I'm watching in particular. So we got to get through the FOMC. We got to get through the big, uh, this is a huge contract expiry. I would suggest all of you in the public just cool your jets and just let's let the market get through this. Then once we're on the other side of this, it's the 16th, no big deal. Next Friday, we should be setting the base for a half-decent Santa, what they call a Santa Claus rally. But for today and into the week, don't go and bet the farm on anything right now, folks. All right. Thank you very much for your awesome best wishes uh, for Lily. I appreciate that. It means a lot to me. So if you don't know what I'm uh, referring to, you see a few people there are uh, giving me best wishes. I always ask, Liam is uh, low-functioning uh, autistic, um, and um, I believe that he is in tune with the universe, and uh, all of your positive karmic uh, messages um, do uh, uh, work their way to him. And I've noticed since I've asked you guys to, to give us cosmic, uh, karmic, cosmic good thoughts, uh, generally speaking, he's been in a pretty good mood. So what the hell? So thank you very much for your uh, uh, best wishes. 
Um, I got to get out of here. Try and stop talking, Brian. Chris, if you could take us on out of here, we'll pick up the conversation um, with, uh, with the Daily Brief tomorrow morning, maybe another three-hour episode, who knows. And maybe what I'll do is I'll answer Friday's questions, which I was supposed to answer on Friday. I'll answer those questions <laughs> tomorrow. All right, everyone. Have yourselves a great day. PMA for the win. All the best. And bye for now.